In 2020, the global sports sponsorship market was worth an estimated $57 billion, according to Statista. And as of 2027, it could be worth an estimated $90 billion. The industry is responsible for creating the largest revenue last year, according to Statista, include financial services, technology, and the automotive sector. Mark Palmer knows all about the value of a good corporate partnership and the return on investment it can offer both a franchise and its fan base. Palmer serves as the Director of Corporate Partnership and Sales for the Toronto Blue Jays, and he took some time out of his schedule to join me this week to discuss how to build effective corporate relationships in sports and how the franchise is eagerly anticipating a full return to Toronto next season. I'm Kevin McShan. Let's have this conversation. So, Mark, if you're ready, I'll welcome you to the program, and I'm excited to talk to you this morning about the value of corporate partnerships in sports. Great to see you this morning, and thank you so very much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Kevin. It's it's great to be with you this morning. Absolutely. Now, Mark, I don't have to tell you that in your role with the Blue Jays, it's all about forming relationships. And to that end, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what makes a good uh, corporate partnership in sport to the value of forming good relationships. Yeah, our business is a lot about um, building relationships and building trust uh, with our partners. And it, it really starts from the very beginning of that process when we're uh, selling or prospecting and negotiating a, a, a partnership with the Toronto Blue Jays. We always start, one of the first things we do when we sit down with any brand is to start with what are their objectives? What are they trying to achieve? What do they, what are their business challenges? What do they think they might be able to achieve with a partnership with the Blue Jays? Um, and so we always falter, fall back to that stance of like, what are the stated objectives? So when talking about building that relationship, it um, I think we start from the beginning about building trust and understanding that we're in this together. We're trying to help whoever that brand is to achieve those objectives. Um, and, and I think just, you know, if, if we maintain that level of trust throughout the uh, process of, of building a partnership together, um, it, it you know, and if, if if a brand feels that they really like working with me or people on my team, um, then we then we've done our job, and and we're helping them to achieve their objectives. But we're doing it in a respectful and honest and trustworthy way. And and even sometimes, like any partnership, there's there's difficult conversations that need to be had. But we have those and are upfront. I think that's where it starts, and you and you start the, that that foundation, that building block of building a strong relationship, and then it, and it grows from there. Absolutely. And now, Mark, you talked about building a level of trust, but I'm also curious to ask you about the strategic advantages that the Blue Jays look for uh, in partnerships, because, you know, there are are certain partnerships that offer a different uh, strategic advantages. So I'm wondering from the Blue Jays perspective, how do you determine uh, the value of the strategic partnership on your end? We are a, a national brand. We have a passionate fan base that's coast to coast as the only Major League Baseball team in Canada. Uh, that's our marketing territory. We literally own the trademark Canada's team. So um, we know that we've got a passionate uh, fan base across the country. So we 
typically look for partner, partnerships that want to speak to those fan bases, the national companies that want to speak to the fan base across the country that are hoping to um, turn our fans into consumers of their product or their service, whatever they have. So, you know, we, we look at ourselves as a tier one property and we want to associate ourselves and align ourselves with tier one or maybe tier two uh, properties, but leaders in their respective categories. And, uh, you know, they, you know, they say that you are judged by the company that you keep. And we're very proud of the roster of companies that we call partners. And that's really where it starts from because we are in that unique position of being the only uh, professional sports team in the country that can offer national marketing rights. And that's not just baseball, that's any sport in Canada. Uh, if you think about um, the NHL, there's there's seven different NHL teams and they each have a territory that they can market to. Our t- whole territory is is the uh, entire country. And that's that's really unique in sports. And it's a, a, you know, a value proposition that we certainly talk about with a lot of our partners. And so then, of course, we look to some of the partners that we have that have that national footprint, that national presence, and how can they help us to build our brand um, and, and to build our fan base across the country and parts of the of the country of Canada that we don't you know, a lot of our fans and we have strong fans in Manitoba or Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, that just have never been able to get to Toronto to, to come see a game live, but they watch us on TV. They watch, you know, follow us on social channels. Um, and so sometimes we look at partnerships of how to, how, who could we work with that can help that may be strong and have footprints in those provinces or in the East to be able to help us grow our brand in those, in our fan base in those markets. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, you, you had mentioned the fact that uh, the Blue Jays own the trademark Canada's team. And I know that the team is very excited to be able to, again, uh, play their games in Canada as a result of the pandemic. So I, I'm curious uh, to get the organization's perspective on how good it feels to be back uh, playing uh, games in Canada. Oh, it feels great. It was a long uh, process. We were 670 days from the time that we last played a regular season home game at Rogers Center here in Toronto to when we uh, played our next one, which was July 30th uh, of this year. So, and a lot of work and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of uh, difficulty in between that time period. When the pandemic hit, we were in the last couple of weeks of spring training in March 2020, getting ready to to come back and ultimately start our season as we had every other year in April uh, back here in Toronto. And so last year was was quite difficult. There was several months of uncertainty uh, at the league level, not even understanding whether we'd get a season in, how long it would be, um, whether we could have fans, all of those different things. Ultimately, a few months of, of that uncertainty led to Major League Baseball being able to uh, announce that there would be a season, although it was shortened from 162 down to 60 games, but there'd be a season uh, and uh, it would have to be played without fans. So. We, 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 as the Blue Jays, had to scramble because uh, of the border restrictions. We were not allowed to have um, our team crisscrossing the border, uh, as well as the visiting team crisscrossing the border to come play games in Toronto. So we had to scramble a little bit. Ultimately, we found a home, and we're happy to um, have that opportunity to play in Buffalo at Salem Field, uh, where we played um, a chunk of our games last year. And then this year... Again, uh, we were in this unique position in baseball where we were the only team that was playing north of the border. And so we wouldn't be able to uh, have those teams or our team crisscross the border. So we had to play about a third of our season in Dunedin at our spring training facility, TD Ballpark. And then we uh, played a third of our season back in Buffalo at Salem Field. And then finally, we were able to get back July 30th and for the rest of the season to play here at Rogers Center. And to answer your question, Kevin, it was, I mean, it was obviously fantastic for the organization to finally get back to Toronto, but for the fans uh, to be able to see the team live again and and for our players to be able to have that home support that they didn't have. We had some fans in Dunedin, we had some fans in Buffalo, but um, not many of those people were Canadians and not many of them were cheering for the Blue Jays, unfortunately. So they're playing home games but not uh, not having that home crowd to support them. So it was great. And the crowds that we had here, although we were limited on capacity uh, for the first few first number of games, we were 15,000 capacity. 
it felt like there was 50,000 here a lot of nights. It was loud. They were very supportive. They were excited to have the team back. And and if you talk to any of the players, they'll really tell you how much difference that makes playing in front of a crowd of any size that is really supportive and cheering for you. So, you know, it was uh, it was been a couple of years of turmoil, but ultimately uh, it felt really good to get back to Toronto and have that uh, that support, be able to play out two months of our season here. Absolutely. You know, Mark, Mark I, I know that a lot of people won't uh, discount the value of human connection ever again, huh? Absolutely. We've, uh, I, you know, I think in many different situations and scenarios, people are, are taking for granted uh, or will never take for granted, I should say, some of the things that they did before uh, and, and human connection and being able to see people and, and associate and, and socialize with people in person is uh, is one of those. Yeah, from a partnership uh, standpoint, Mark, I'm curious how the uh, pandemic has affected the job that you do, do that you do on a daily basis. Well, we were the one positive side of it is that we the, some of the work that we do on the corporate partnership side is not related to having fans in stands or or where we're playing our games. So. Uh, we were certainly affected from a revenue standpoint. Um, you know, the, the corporate partnerships is a is a major source of revenue for for us and for any professional sports team. So, uh, losing that revenue of ticket sales, as I said, we didn't in 2020. We had no ticket sales because we were playing all of our games in Buffalo with no fans. Uh, and in in parts of 21, we were playing in front of a small number of fans in Dunedin and a and slightly bigger number of fans in Buffalo. So those are those are major sources of revenue to miss out on ticket sales. So uh, sponsorship became very important. How do you know in the partnerships that we have, and how do we provide value and assets to our partner base that we can execute regardless of where the team was. Because even even when the se season started and we knew we were hopefully uh, going to get 162 games in 81 at home, we didn't know if that where that was going to be, if we were ever going to get back to Toronto this year or if it was going to be uh, in Dunedin or Buffalo. So we had to be fairly nimble to be able to work with our partners on a number of different things. Some of those things, you know, outfield wall signage. If you watch any of the games in Dunedin or Buffalo, you you saw the same outfield wall signs as you would here in uh, Toronto. So we were able to do that or the behind home plate signage. Those are broadcast visible media assets that we could we could execute regardless of where we we're playing or whether there's fans in the stands. Uh, some of the other things we we had to pivot and and come up with different things that would be uh, enticing for partners to want to be a, a, a associated with. A lot of that, of course, moved to digital and some of the and social and and how do we integrate our partners into some of the things that we're doing digitally and socially and provide them value, but also uh, provide uh, value and and. Um, interesting engaging opportunities for our fans so it, it it fortunately like i said we we had some things that we were still able to do uh we were affected like everybody else suddenly having to work from home and not seeing uh, each other on a in the office on a daily basis and having that collaboration uh in person but we you know we were able to make the best of it and, and still maintain a, a significant portion of our revenue even though we we lost a lot of the things that we would have otherwise been able to uh, extract revenue from absolutely and mark i'm excited to talk to you at the end of october because i don't know if you knew this but october is actually national disability Disability Employment Awareness Fund. So I'm curious to ask you about uh, establishing more diversity in terms of employment for individuals with disabilities and your uh, opinion on the significance of a month. Well, we, as an organization, we've certainly looked at our um, de and i initiatives uh quite seriously like many other organizations have over the last couple of years and we've formed committee you know all of them all employees it's now mandated there's there's um diversity training and inclusion uh training that happens on an annual basis and really taking some uh, you know a serious look about um the 
who that we have uh, here that we've that we hired and who we're hiring and including. And it's not just about hiring, but all the different things. We got to think about our fan base, those people that are coming into the stadium. Um, how are we making it an enjoyable experience for all people, regardless of of their situation? So it's uh, it's an important important topic and one that I think we've done a very good job of. Also, with some direction from Rogers, because we're owned by Rogers Communications, so uh, they're doing some great work as well, and and we're proud to to, to be part of that and, and say that we're doing what we can to help improve things. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, I'm curious for you, what's the best part of your job for you personally? Oh, listen, I I love. I mean, working in sports is a great uh, it's a great career field many people want to do it um and and there isn't a ton of jobs in it it's um it's a passion for a lot of people i i grew up a blue jays fan and so to be here years later knowing that i um was a fan at a young age i would come down with my family and my parents would bring me down to toronto uh, to games and and then to one day be able to work for uh the toronto blue jays it's um you know, sometimes I pinched myself early in my career going, I'm actually working for this team that I grew up as a fan of. I didn't, it wasn't a career path that I ever thought was even possible. So that was sort of the earlier in my career was just really the excitement around this was, this was my job. But I'd say now, um, you know, in the role that I do as director of corporate partnerships, I, I really enjoy the process of uh, bringing partnerships to life. And, and I, I had a bit of a creative background. I actually went to the University of Windsor for visual arts originally before graduating with a communications degree. And so that I find that a corporate partnership, the sales process in, involves obviously not only sales and negotiation, but um, also the, the creative. I get to use my creative side as well of thinking about a brand and what their objectives are. Now we we go to work after hearing that around how could how could we do something unique and engaging for uh, with the Blue Jays. So I think that combination of, of the, you know, the sales and marketing and creativity, I really enjoy. And I love the fact that I deal with a lot of different industries um, and, and I'm forced to learn about those industries fairly in depth so that I can speak intelligently to the brands and the companies that we might be pitching. I, one day I, I might be talking to somebody in you know the automotive industry the next day could be a national restaurant chain the next day could be a, a an automotive manufacturer and so being able to um, get a, a breadth of knowledge around a lot of different industries and, and being forced to do that to be good at what I do it's um, that's that's an interesting part of the job that I really like as well yeah absolutely and mark for anyone that that wants to maybe explore a career in sports uh, for a young person that may be considering a career in this industry. What's your best piece of advice for them as they look to achieve success? I think the best piece of advice I'd probably give is to say, keep an open mind, uh, be patient. Uh, when I say open mind, a lot of people, at least maybe maybe less so now, but when I was coming up um, in you know earlier parts of my career, a lot of people said, "Well, I want to work for MLSC, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, or I want to work for the Blue Jays, or I want to work for the NFL." Um, and and there just isn't that many jobs. There's there's more people coming out of um, uh, school programs and you, that are are teaching sports marketing or teaching sport management that are coming out than there are jobs available. But what I would say is uh, keep an open mind and or, or think about other opportunities that work it to work in sports without working for a sports property or a league for that for that matter. We I know a number of people in, in the industry who who work in sports, but that you know they might work for a bank, T D bank or Scotia Bank. They're you know, people that are dedicated to hockey sponsorship or or sports sponsorships within an, a larger organization that doesn't you know um, participate in sports otherwise so keep an open mind that way and I think um, you know early in the career or earlier in, in the journey of starting a career it's really about learning 
as much as it is about learning what you really love to do, it's about learning what you don't love and, and sometimes getting some experience and saying, that's not for me. That's what I, I you know, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And, and this direction I was going in isn't working. So um, being, you know, I know pivot became the word of the pandemic, but being um, nimble and able to pivot to say, yeah, and, and, and collect those um, experiences along the way. I've, when I came out of uh, George Brown, I took a George Brown postgrad in sports marketing. When I came out, I didn't want to work in sales at all. I didn't had no interest in sales. Um, and I've been in sales now for 18 years, started out on the ticket side of the business and uh, and then moved over 10 years ago to, to the sponsorship sales side. And that's where I would, you know, again, talk about being open minded and, and getting different experiences. And if I had took that experience and realized I hated sales and it, and it um, solidified my thought process on that, then, you know, I might have left this industry a long time ago, but I, I was open minded. I took a job in sales. I actually thought, you know, I had some success in it and, and it's been now 18 years, as I said. Well, you must be doing something right if you've lasted 18 years, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> hey, Mark, uh, watching baseball and being a part of the atmosphere in Toronto uh, in the playoffs, I know that there isn't a sort of Anything like a, a Blue Jays home game when, when the team makes the playoffs. So tell me, what's the team most excited about about the, this upcoming season after the World Series is concluded? What are you most excited about on the on the field for next year? We the the way our 2021 season finished, uh, aside from making the playoffs, I, I think probably finishes the best it possibly could. We got right down to the wire, literally hours. You know, we were um, we we had to win three games against Baltimore to finish the the season, and we did. And they were exciting games with home runs, and um, you know, we did we did a great job. And even down to the final game ended, and and. The fans who were in the stadium, uh, our, our game entertainment team put the, the Boston Red Sox game on the, the video board so all the fans that were there could see what uh, what was going to happen in that game. Because ultimately, if the Red Sox had lost, we would have been in a tie with them to get into the playoffs. They won the game and, and the rest is history. So we didn't make the playoffs. But the way the season finished was really strong. We've, uh, we're really excited about the future in the next little while of this team with you know, you saw Vladimir Guerrero Jr. come out this year as a, you know, an MVP caliber season. Bo Bichette had a fantastic year. We, you know, George Springer had a decent year, even though he was injured for a big, big part of it, um, but was still there in the clubhouse with his leadership skills and, and uh, experiences. So we're um, really set up well over the next few years to um, be able to continue to grow. And, and we see ourselves as a contender uh, perennial contender for for the next little while, and so we're we're really excited. Uh, I, I I'm watching a little bit of the World Series, but I'm really focused on next year and and uh, where we're we're what we can do as a team, and excited to see where this goes. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about having a hold on the imagination of Canadian uh, sports fans. So I, I'm also curious to ask you about the economic impact that the organization sees uh, when they are successful and, and the impact it has on the local and national economy in Canada. Absolutely. When we're, you know, aside from the economic impact of ourselves being able to, you know, when the stadium's full and we were in those, um, you know, 2015, 2016, I think you talked about earlier, Kevin, when we were in the playoffs, we hadn't been in the playoffs since since 1993. So we were at that time, you know, it, it captivated the entire country. And we you you saw not only were we selling out our our games we were you know, 48,000 almost 50,000 people crammed in here every night at the end of the season and through the playoffs but the bars and restaurants around uh in Toronto and 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 I say in Toronto around the stadium but there was many times where uh, Sportsnet our broadcaster would be doing live hits from a bar in Calgary and you would just see packed restaurant all there with Blue Jays gear on to watch the games and that's the kind of uh, impact nationally that we can have when the team is is making the playoffs and going for a run you know or it, on a run through the playoffs I, I said earlier we have that national fan base and I like to joke sometimes that in you know Canadians are either 
a Blue Jays fan or they're not a fan of baseball because most Canadians, uh, if they like baseball, are, are a Blue Jays fan. And when we're winning and, and it's the team to get behind, it's um, it's it's pretty exciting. So it can certainly draw a lot of tourism dollars locally, but also uh, hospitality dollars uh, right across the country. Yeah, and with the impact of COVID, uh, ho the hospitality industry needs a big boost. So uh, I appreciate the work that the Blue, Blue Days are doing in that regard. But I'm, I'm curious, Mark, for you uh, personally outside of work, what, what do you like to do to keep yourself occupied? And what's the best part for you about being Canadian? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm a very, very proud Canadian, always have been. Um, I, you know, I cheer for everything ca Canadian, whether that's uh, our national teams when we're when we're in the Olympics. Um, you know, strong supporter of all Canadian, all things Canadiana from artists. We've got some incredible music artists that have come, you know, national or not national, global, global leaders in in um, in certain musical fields. And so. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a proud Canadian, and I love what Canadians stand for and who we are as a people. Um, and to, you know, to answer your question, I guess I'm what I'm passionate about outside of work. At work is very busy, and it's 12 months of the year. But it's um, I'm a father of of two boys that are are 12 and 10, so they're obviously my top priority, and I get a lot of joy seeing them grow up and and become the young men that they have been or young boys i should say that they have be, become and now that their sports are are back up and running for the most part i i spend a lot of time carpooling to hockey and football and and baseball practices and um sitting in traffic in toronto to get to those places but as we talked about earlier that's something that i'll never complain about again because uh, when that was all taken away and and the sports were were all shut down i i actually really miss that you know that time with the kids in the car and and driving to their their uh, sports practices so i that's that's a key priority for me and then i i i love you know weight training and getting myself to the gym hopefully five days a week and and, you know, it's it's good for physical and mental health. And uh, actually, just this week started a, a six week workout and diet challenge at my F45 gym this week. So you can ask me about that again in December to see how it went. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll uh, check back in with you to see if you uh, remain committed for sure. But there you go. Uh, absolutely. And Mark, my final question for you this morning is. For any, is there anyone that wants to partner with the Blue Jays or get in contact with you to explore a partnership? What's the best way they can do that? Uh, let's look me up uh, LinkedIn. I'm I'm on there. If you put in Mark Palmer Blue Jays, you'll I'll be the only one to come up and uh, or or shoot me a note. Mark Palmer at BlueJays.com, and we'll I'm happy to chat. Fantastic. Well, Mark, I really enjoyed uh, the time I got to spend with you this morning. Anytime I get a chance to uh, uh, interview a fellow Canadian, I'm always happy. So good time, energy, and efforts on my behalf are most appreciated. And I want to thank you for being here to talk all about corporate partnerships in sports. It's most appreciated. Yeah, it was my pleasure, Kevin. It's great to be with you this morning and, and congratulations on the success of your podcast so far, so far and keep up that good work.